Hello everyone and welcome to my guide in how to get started with being a GCI aka Magic. Now this guide does have Enigma's Cold War server in mind as it's part of the beginner series there, but this should apply to most other servers where the caveat some things may be different here and there. As with all of my guides, I've broken this up into different sections, and you'll find the relevant time cards down below, so you can skip to the one that you find most relevant for you. To begin with, we're going to be looking at what a GCI is, and importantly, how it can really help your team to really win a campaign. As part of that, we'll be looking at what the various tasks are that a GCI is aiming to accomplish. After that, we'll get into the technical details of how to give GCI callouts, how to announce that you are a GCI on the server, how to give the callouts in the correct format so that everybody knows exactly what it is you're trying to relay to them, as well as looking out for when you should give information and some extra little tips on the best way to present information. And then the final section is going to be one to really advise people on how to get started because being GCI can be incredibly stressful and intimidating at first and so I've just got a few guides of how you can kind of dip your toe in the water without having to jump headlong into a massive task. So that's the video ahead of us so let's dive in. So first off then what is a GCI? Well GCI stands for Ground Control Interception and so what you really are is a radar operator relaying information to the rest of your team to allow them to do what they can do to the best of their abilities. To do this role, you join in one of the JTAC forward controller slots on the server, and this will grant you a view that shows you everything that your team's various early warning systems can see. And the bread and butter of being a GCI is to give this information to the pilots flying around quickly, concisely, and in a format that makes it very clear to them to get the information they need. Now to kind of describe how this helps your team and what you're really going to be aiming to do, I've broken down GCI into a number of different component tasks. And I'd say the number one role that you have as GCI is to avoid friendly fire incidents. Even if you don't really manage to do anything else, if you avoid a friendly firing on another friendly, then you have done your job for the day. It is very, very easy to misidentify something, especially in large furballs. As I'm sure you all know, friendly fire kills are something that happens, but GCIs can really help with this, either by giving... Warnings if you see a friendly slotting in on another friendly, or listening out if any friendlies are asking you to identify a target that is off their nose. Second task is to give players warnings to immediate threats to themselves. That is, enemies just about to make a guns pass on them, or enemies that have just fired missiles on them. It's very important to be able to get that information to those players very, very quickly. Again, this saves friendly pilots in the heat of combat. But those two short-term tasks aside, your major task that you're going to be spending most of your time doing as GCI is giving players awareness of the battlefield. And this comes out through giving them bra calls. We'll go into the details of those bra calls in the next section. But what you're doing here is letting the players know where nearby threats are so they know either to be able to avoid those threats or know which direction to head in if they're wanting to engage those threats. This helps your players find targets and spend far, far less time wandering around trying to search for enemies. Now, the final task that I'd say a GCI is responsible for, and by far the hardest task, is to fully coordinate the battlefield. Really, as a GCI, you shouldn't simply be giving nearest bogey dope threats. You should be trying to split up your forces so that everyone is being utilised to the best of their abilities. This is to avoid things like having five players chasing down the same lone target while an enemy strike uh, operation goes in completely uncontested a little bit further along the front. 
by managing and coordinating your team, you can make your team punch far above its weight, and this can really change the tide of a campaign. A lot of this does come with practice, so it will take you a bit of the time to understand how you're going to do this, and do note that pilots being pilots will sometimes just head towards the nearest threat no matter what you try and tell them to do. But still, you can get to learn which pilots will do what you ask them to do, and you can make great use of that defending your own ground attack assets, intercepting key enemy players, and overall doing a huge amount more damage than your team would if they're just left to their uncoordinated devices. So, as we said, you become a GCI by joining the JTAC slot on a server. Do note that you do need the Combined Arms expansion pack to be able to join this slot, but once you're in it, you'll get a top-down view much like the normal F10 map. However, you can see all friendly contacts and all enemy contacts that are detected by your early warning radar systems. That is both the ground-based systems and your AWACS, and sometimes things that your ground troops detect will also pop up. Now, your key role is to be able to give that information to the players, and that's what we're going to be looking at in this section. You can just talk to them like normal people, but the problem is that there is a lot of information to give out, a lot of different people out there, and a lot of them aren't going to be speaking perfect English, and there's a lot of crosstalk, so having a normal conversation really isn't ideal. Instead, we've got a standardised format of how to give that information in a very clear way means the information gets to those who need it the most. Now, the first thing you want to do when joining the JTAC slot is to let everyone know that you are there and so they can start requesting help. You want to pick a frequency that you're going to primarily operate in. I almost always use frequency 251. That is the general frequency on Enigma's Cold War that is used for inter-team communication. Almost every plane starts off already tuned into that. Just about everyone can hear it, and so it's a good one to get information to the most people as possible. You can certainly use others, especially if there are two GCI on, or if you're wanting to specifically communicate with helicopters, but for a starting point I'd use 251. If you're not sure how to tune into 251 or you don't have SRS set up, please see my previous video on CAP where I've got a full tutorial of how to get that set up and how to tune in. Now once you are on, you want to give a clear call out to let everyone know. The standard format of that is the following. All call signs magic is sunrise on 251. All call signs just lets everyone know that is who you're talking to. Magic is your call sign. You can use others, but magic is what most people are assuming the GCI will be using, and so no matter what your call sign, most will uh, want to talk to you with magic. Sunrise is just a code sign for coming online, and 251 is the frequency. Replace that with whatever else you're using. From there, what you want to do is get an impression of who is on SRS listening to comms at that moment. Very often you will find that many players that are flying around are either not on SRS or are not paying attention to SRS. You really want to focus your efforts on those players who are going to be there listening to you. Now, after you've given the sunrise call out, what you'll often find is that several players will immediately check in with you, and so just note down their names and keep an eye on those players in particular. If there's anyone who you think needs vital information and you're not sure about, you can just give a call out, or you can always simply ask the question, call sign XX, are you on comms? Very often they will then reply, letting you know that they're around. Do note there is a shorthand that many players use if they simply tap the SRS button without sending anything, but it is shorthand for an affirmative, that they've heard your last message. You can see this as in the lower right corner or wherever you've placed your SRS display, you will get a little name appearing next to the channel that you're transmitting on for anyone else who transmitted on that channel. So just keep an ear out. Very often when players are busy, they will just give you the affirmation like that just by tapping their push to talk button. Now, sooner or later, you're going to need to give out your first bra call. 
This will either be in response to a player requesting a bogey dope, or you deciding that a certain pilot needs to know a certain piece of information. The bra call, as covered in the cat video, but I'll go back over it here, is a concise way to give information on an incoming bandit, or possibly friendly. The bra call has several independent sections. First you give the call sign of the player you're trying to contact. Optionally you can then say magic afterwards to confirm your own call sign. This is not always necessary, but can be very helpful. Then briefly describe what it is you are referencing. So if there are two hostile MiG-21 fishbed coming towards the player, simply say threat, two ship, fishbed. Then you begin the BRA procedure. BRA stands for bearing, range, altitude, and aspect. Bearing is the compass bearing from the friendly plane you are contacting to the enemy planes that you are referencing. To find this on the GCI view, click the ruler icon at the top corner, and then right click on the friendly plane and drag a line over to the hostile contact. On the ruler line you've just drawn, there will be both the range and the bearing listed along the side there. When giving bearings, always use three digit codes, even if it starts with a zero. This is just to be absolutely clear in case any information is garbled during transmission. So if they're on a bearing of 060, do pronounce all three digits. The next part is range. This will be the range either in kilometers or in nautical miles. Which one you use depends on what the pilot would be flying. For the most part, red four planes use kilometers, blue four planes use miles, but there is some overlap there. If in doubt, you can always end the range with the units that you are using. So for example, say 20 kilometers. If you want to change what is being displayed in the F10 map, then simply click the FT2M, or the other way around button, on the top, and it will invert between Imperial and metric units. Between the bearing and the range callout, you should use the word for. So for example, bearing 060 for 20 miles is the correct callout. Afterwards, we say the altitude, we say that we're saying the altitude by saying the word at, and then we give the altitude either in kilometers or in thousands of feet. If giving the altitude in thousands of feet, you can optionally use the prefix angels, i.e. angels 10 is 10,000 feet. However, you don't have to. You can simply say 10,000 feet. Some purists will say that you shouldn't use angels callouts when talking about hostile aircraft, but the in-game early warning radar system does use angels, so if you want to be consistent with that, you can quite happily use that. Finally, we have aspect. This is the direction the hostile contact is moving relative to the contact you are talking to. There are five general bearings that we give here. The first is hot. Hot means the contact is heading directly towards your plane of interest means they're closing in on the plane, likely they know where your plane is, and they are trying to target it. Second to this is flanking. This is moving in the general direction of your plane, but not directly at it. This should always be accompanied by a second indication to show whether they are moving either left or right from the perspective of the plane, or you can give compass readouts. So for example, you can say flanking north, or flanking left would both be perfectly acceptable. This just gives the plane some indication of how they need to adjust their course in order to make an intercept value. The next aspect is beam. This is moving at 90 degrees to the direction of the plane you're calling out to. And again, you want to accompany this with either a left or a right, or a compass bearing with the direction that plane is moving in. Turn further away from that is drag. This means moving in the general direction of away, but not directly away. And just as with flanking and beam, this needs some kind of additional piece of information to say whether they are moving to the left or the right from the perspective of the person you're talking to. 
And then finally we have cold. Cold means moving directly away from the person you're talking to, in all likelihood running away from the person you're talking to. So putting all that together, an imagined callout could be call sign XX to ship MiG-21 bra 065 for 12 at Angel 6 flank left. Just to get some idea of how I'd be commonly using these, here's just a couple of callouts that I used in a recent flyout, so you can see how I'd be using these and how I'd be measuring things in real time. Uh, new pop-up group F5 to intercept turn 154 for 55. Target is flanking north, heading towards friendly Mirage. Long ship be aware, hostile A4 on the front line, 280 for 30. Charger 1 magic. Uh, platoon uh, left hand side, air base. Uh, this will be, be our first two times F5 approaching 124 two. for 40 at 2.7 kilometers. So, bra calls are your bread and butter for GCI, but you will need to make other calls. One thing you very often want to do is when a fight is moving to visual range, you probably want to stop referencing compass bearings and instead start referencing clock bearings. For example, saying a bandit is now on your three o'clock, tracking left, means that it's on the right hand side from the point of view of the cockpit, and it is moving around to the front of the cockpit. Also, instead of altitude callouts there, you very often want to simply refer to high or low. What this allows is the pilot to keep the head completely out of the pit, be looking around without having to worry about where their current direction is or what their current altitude is to make sense of your callouts. You might also need to give very quick emergency callouts at any point, such as if you see a missile being fired. The general procedure here is to begin with break, break, break. That is the general call for everybody on the frequency to stop talking as you've got something urgent to say. Then immediately give the call sign and again say evade or break or missile. For example, if I see a missile being launched at, I'd say break, 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 call sign XX, evade, 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 missile on your six, evade, evade, evade. You really want this to be as concise as possible, but as clear as possible. Don't worry about giving too much information, just give them the bare bones of what they need to do in that instant to stay alive. After they've dealt with the immediate threat, you can by all means then go back and give them more detailed information about what launched on them, where it is, where they're going, and so on. Other general considerations to have when giving out information is that it's not always a good idea to give simply the bearing on its own, but a very good idea instead to give an intercept angle. If something is beam or flanking, you want to instead direct them to the bearing that they need to take in order to have that quickest intercept. It does take a little bit of time to get practice with getting these right, just kind of try and visually judge it is the best way. The more practice you have, the better you'll be able to do this. But again, using the ruler, instead of sketching a line to where the enemy aircraft is, sketch it to where you think the intercept point should be and give that bearing and range. It is also very important whenever giving out callouts to include information on any friendlies in the area, especially if the player is nearing an engagement. If they know that there are friendlies in the area, they can be much, much more careful, and so again, reducing the chance of those friendly fire incidents. Otherwise, other pieces of information will come naturally or be directly asked by the pilots, and you can simply follow up on those. If they ask you for speeds of the enemy aircraft, you can click on the aircraft to get additional information on them. Or if they ask for something like the bearing to the nearest airfield, just take time and give them the information as clearly and concisely as possible. And finally, the last call out you'll make every day is to let everyone know that you are no longer going to be on as magic. Really important because players will be more or less depending on you at that point. Good idea to let them know that they do have to fall back on their EWR systems. 
The standard callout for this is simply magic is going midnight on 251. If you forget that, simply say magic is having to leave at this point. Something along those lines. Just do let everyone know so that they don't give out a bogey dope to you in an emergency and suddenly get themselves in hot water. So that's the technical bits. And there will be other callouts you will give that you will need. You'll get used to those as you go. For this last section, I want to tackle ways of getting around the fact this can be really intimidating at first. Being a GCI is very, very stressful. You feel like you've got all these players completely relying on you. Every time they get shot down, you blame yourself. It's incredibly stressful. Not helped by the fact that some players will be rather irate with you if you don't see something or you mess up a call sign. So you need to find a way to ease yourself into it. My big advice here would be initially do GCIing for small groups. You can even do GCIing just for an individual. Just jump on Discord with someone, be their private GCI, jump in the JTAC slot, and simply give them all the callouts that you need. You can then focus all your attention on one player. If it's a friend, you know they're less likely to chew you out if anything goes wrong. And even this is helping your team. Even having just one player with access to a GCI is better than nobody with access to a GCI. If you're feeling happy with that, you've gotten used to the callouts, you're getting the pacing of the communication right, you can then move up to a slightly larger group. Again, I'd advise Discord for this, or a smaller SRS channel, where you're really just focusing on a handful of players, ones that you can easily keep an eye on, so you're just looking in one area, ideally ones that are in close contact with each other, so that you're not having to jump back and forth across the map, and again, ideally people you're comfortable with that you're not going to worry too much about messing up about. And then when you're ready to jump on to be a full team GCI, one thing that really helped me is setting an initial time limit. My first session GCIing was only about half an hour or so. I was absolutely exhausted at the end of that half hour, but I learned a lot. I think if I'd pushed it too much on that first session, it'd probably put me off. But getting in a small, short section really is quite good for you. You can go back, think about what you learned. It builds up your confidence a little bit. And then you can come back the next time feeling a lot better about yourself. You can also start off doing GCI when the server's a little bit quieter, just so there are fewer people that you need to keep an eye on. That can help reduce the stress as well. And finally, just remember, you will make mistakes, and that is absolutely fine. You don't jump into a plane in DCS and assume that you're going to be in ace first time, so you shouldn't be jumping into the GCI slot expecting perfection from yourself first time. Try and focus on the good things. If you save one pilot for making a friendly fire call, that's brilliant. If you give one call out that helps your team stop a strike mission, that's brilliant. And try not to feel bad if you send pilots out and they get shot down. Ultimately, there's not much you can do as a GCI once the combat has started. It's then just up to those pilots there to do their best. You are, at that point, really a spectator. And sometimes fights will go well, sometimes they won't. And honestly, even when I felt my GCIing wasn't particularly good when I've been making mistakes, after the session when I'm jumping off, there's always a load of thanks from the various pilots there. So people really do appreciate GCIing, and I know when I'm flying, a GCI is really a game changer. And I'd love to see more people on Enigma's Cold War taking that spot, giving that help to their team, so by all means, jump on in there, give it a go. If you have any questions that I've not covered, please do leave them down below. I'll try and get back to those as soon as I can. And otherwise, I hope to catch you in a future video. Till then, remember to be kind to yourselves and everyone else. Cheers.